why it came up. has a, a great talk in store for us, but it's going to take all of the time. So I'm going to jump right in. My name is Afton Thomas. I am Associate Director for Programs here at the Center for the Study of Southern Culture. I'm so excited. This is our second South Talk of the season, but our first one in the Tupelo Room. And it's a packed house. Thank you all for coming. Okay, before I introduce today's guest, I have a few announcements. First, I would like to thank the Census Director, Katie McKee, for listening to programming ideas and sharing interesting ideas that come across her desk. Thank you to the Center's Communications Specialist, Rebecca Law Cleary, and Associate Director for Publications, Jenny Thomas, for helping to spread the word for our programming. Without them, we would not have you in these seats. Thank you to the Southern Studies graduate assistants, Brittany Brown and Janine Talbot. Brittany is responsible for the cool social media graphics and e-newsletter, and Janine will be here each week filming the talks and uploading them to the center's YouTube channel so that you can watch them back or catch the ones that you miss. So thank you both for all you have done in the short amount of time that we've had this semester. Next week, we have two events. Wednesday, September 13th, same time, noon, we welcome Dr. Jessica Taylor. She will give a talk titled, Running Away from Early America, Escaping Servitude and Slavery in the 17th Century, English Colonies Demanded Creativity in the Face of Surveillance and Threats of Violence. How did runaways seek freedom in 17th century Virginia and with whom? Taylor will discuss ongoing efforts to document glimpses of conspiracies and plots found in court records and what they can teach researchers and our students. The next day, Thursday, September 14th at 5 p.m., we have a different kind of talk, it's not a lecture. It's a gallery walk. And we welcome Professor of Art and Head of Imaging Arts here at the University of Mississippi, Brooke White, whose um, photography and uh, is displayed in our Gamble Gallery here. Um, Professor White's exhibit, Year of Wandering, is inspired by nature and the COVID pandemic. Come learn about the exhibit and ask questions during this event where we gather in the space with the artists. There will be a light reception. So that's from five to six next Thursday. These are just two of the many events we have coming up this semester during our theme, Creativity in the South. Please follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Sign up to receive our e-newsletter. Grab a copy of our Southern Register, which is in our foyer in the lobby out there. In our foyer. <laughs> um, it has all of our events um, in the front of it and stories, things that are happening here at the center. So I encourage you to grab one. They're also trying to give you the information in lots of different forms. Just the word doc on that table out there with the list of our events as well. Okay, so now for the reason we're all here. David McRaney is a science journalist fascinated with brains, minds, and culture. He created the podcast, You Are Not So Smart, based on his internationally best-selling book of the same name and its follow-up, You Are Now Less Dumb. Before that, he cut his teeth as a newspaper reporter in Mississippi covering Hurricane Katrina on the Gulf Coast and in the Pine Belt region. Later, he covered things like who tests rockets for NASA, what it is like to run a halfway home for homeless people who are HIV positive, and how a family sent their kids to college by making and selling knives. Since then, he has been an editor, photographer, voiceover artist, television host, journalism teacher, lecturer, and tornado survivor from someone who is from St. Louis and know about that. <laughs> Most recently, here in Mississippi. Most recently, after finishing his latest book, he wrote, I produced and recorded a six-hour audio documentary exploring the history of the idea and the word genius, which is the topic for his next book. This event is a partnership with the University of Mississippi's Department of Writing and Rhetoric and the Department of Philosophy and Religion. So I also want to thank both Dr. Neil Manson and Dr. Stephen Monroe for working with us <coughs> on this event. Please help me welcome David McKay. <laughs> I'm 
Okay. Oh, that is such a good introduction. I don't have to say any of that again. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, I'm a science journalist. It took a long, circuitous route to get there. And uh, once I was doing that sort of thing, I was happy to get a chance to write a new book. And I wanted to do it in a sort of southern style, which to me meant the book will tell you what it's about about halfway through if you're doing a good job. <laughs> And uh, yeah, that's what happened with this project. I started thinking I knew one thing, and by the end of it, I thought another thing. And this works well for when I'm promoting it. I get to tell people, in writing a book about how people change their minds, I change my mind about how people change their minds and how to change people's minds. So I'll tell you some of the story of that and then get into a bunch of fun examples and just sort of go crazy with it. We'll just play around and have fun with it. Uh, the story starts uh, during this sort of moral panic that I think you all remember. Uh, it, for me, it really got going in 2016 uh, when the Oxford Dictionary, not this Oxford, named Post Truth its word <laughs> of the year. And right there up front, it says, It's official, the truth is dead, facts are passe. That's in the New York Times. That felt really weird to see that. But that was just the beginning. It became this avalanche of these kinds of stories. You had, uh, the uh, New York Times Magazine writing, we've been in the age of post-street politics, and the Atlantic comes along with why facts don't change our minds, and then you get Vox coming in, the Atlantic coming in with uh, New York with that, and then the Atlantic saying, this article won't change your mind about articles about how articles won't change your mind, won't change your mind about these articles, and it started feeling that crazy. We are talking about this endlessly, and it was a real moral panic. It felt like the satanic panic to me, which some of you know what that was. That, it felt like that. It felt like, are we really, Freaking out over the internet is have we entered this epistemic chaos? And yet, Vox comes along and says America is now facing an epistemic crisis. You get all these hearings that are trying to put people to task in politics. And whatever the person said, people on one side saw one thing and people on the other side saw another. And that led to the real capstone of all this in 2017. Time Magazine, real cover, is truth dead? And it sounds like when the old movie, you know, movie announcer was like, is truth dead scary? And I was benefiting from this, unfortunately, or, or fortunately, depending on the day that I was looking at it, because I had a podcast and a blog and a series of books about why people do all these things. And this was playing right into my narrative. It was playing right into my hypothesis that, yeah, some people are unreachable. So it's, 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 you can't reason the person out of a position you have to reason them into. That's where I was at. I was saying, yeah, you're not going to change some people's minds. Stop doing this. You have to find other ways. But at the same time this was happening, this happened. The entire country changed its mind about same-sex marriage. And I brought in some people on my podcast to talk about it, some political scientists. And they told me that this was the fastest change of public opinion ever recorded. And we've been recording it since around the 20s. And I was astonished by this. But I looked at it. And I'm looking at this chart, we've got roughly 60% of the country in, in 10 years ago, 12, 10 to 12 years ago, they uh, are totally opposed to this concept. No, I do not support same-sex marriage. And then a decade later, that same 60% is like, yeah, I'm totally in favor of it. I'll fight for it. I'll vote for it. So I imagine, what if we took all those millions of people, put them in a time machine, had them go back and meet themselves a decade ago, and had them talk about this, would they argue about it? And would they argue about it with the same behemoths that people argue about wedge issues today? And if so, like, would they refuse to budge? So what, what's going on in their minds for real? And when they flipped, what happened there? Between these two points, I want to know what happened in their brain. How do minds change the level of neurons and move up? And on top of that, this was challenging all of my other concepts about maybe you can reason people out positions. Clearly something's going on here. I need to understand it. And I was like, that's the book I want to write. I do not understand this. Maybe I'll learn something if I go on the road. So I went on the road. One of the first places I went was Westboro Baptist Church. I went to their Valentine's Day services, which were uh, OK. <laughs> uh, and then uh, I remember writing the book. The thing that shocked me the most is I grew up here in the deep south. I went to a Baptist church when I was a kid. Uh, the thing that was most unsettling to me was that it was very familiar there. It, uh, it, it actually wasn't shocking. They just had a gimmick. That's all I felt about it, and that said something to me. When I went across the road, that's the Rainbow House. You can imagine that uh, they live in a, a suburb called Westboro, which has ruined the names of all the shops. Nobody wants to shop at Westboro, get gifts and, and candles, but it's there. Uh, the real estate's very cheap there, so someone bought a house for $40,000 and turned it into a halfway home for LGBT youth. 
And uh, they do all sorts of trolley things. They have like a, a wedding for Gandalf and Dumbledore and the front lawn and stuff like that. And I went over there and had coffee with them and they were great. It was like something about this also is mysterious to me because people come out every day and change the marquee and you guys wave and go, hey neighbor, and you don't burn down each other's places. So what do you think is going on with that? And they had a lot to say about it. And then I also met with the people here who had left and that was what I really came to do is I wanted to understand what encouraged you to leave? Like, were you persuaded? Were you not persuaded? Was it cultural? And from there, I went on to uh, meet the, the person who used to be the leader of the flat, not flat of the 9 11 truthers, people who don't believe that uh, the official story of 9 11 is true. And uh, this is a man who was excommunicated from that group for changing his mind. They nearly ruined his life. They uh, even went so far as to Photoshop uh, his niece and nephew's faces by getting into his Facebook page on the child pornography and send it to his mom. That's how angry they were with him just for leaving their organization. So I discussed with him, what was that like? And why did you change your mind? What's the fallout like? And from there, I spent time with organizations who professionally change people's minds. They go door to door in Los Angeles. I went there six times until I learned the process and went door to door with them. They knock on people's doors in areas that they know that uh, are more, the people are more likely to have voted a certain way. And in 20 minutes, they're able to change their mind on extreme wedge issues. And I learned their techniques, it's all important. Uh, I also spent time with magicians and uh, con artists who taught me their techniques for manipulating people in Texas. While I was in Texas, I also spent time with street epistemology people. These are people who do similar techniques to the previous group, who are called deep canvassers. Turned out their techniques are almost identical. They go uh, to college campuses and change people's minds in about 20 minutes about contentious issues. Uh, and then I ended up in Sweden, where live on stage at their version of South by Southwest, I used those techniques to uh, try to change the mind of the spokesperson for the Flat Earthers. Uh, if you've ever seen the Flat Earther documentary on Netflix, he's the main character, and uh, he's fantastic. And I love the Flat Earthers. Of all the cults and pseudo cults that I embedded with for this project, Flat Earthers are the most fun. Like they really know a party. They're really cool, and they're very open-minded and scientifically curious people except about one very sticky <laughs> um, And I'm very proud of this uh, in our conversation, which is very difficult to do in front of an audience because you're supposed to do it privately to two people. He at least got to the point where he's like, I could be wrong about that, and that felt like a win. Um, also, so I took all this to scientists, and all the scientists told me all sorts of things. I learned about people who understand how we develop different forms of color vision, uh, people here at NYU uh, who they study how children form their models of reality and change them over time. I went to big PR firms, Ogilvy here. Uh, There's Rory Sutherland, who's probably the world's most, he's the real Don Draper of the day, who taught me how they take all this science and use it to try to sell you soap. And I uh, then went through all the literature, all these different uh, models of how we do and do not change our mind and why we resist and how to get around that resistance. And all of it coalesced into how minds change. And it's really been strange to see how well this has been received. Uh, I'm going all over the world talking about it now, and different groups have different reasons to want to learn this. Some seem nefarious, and I say no. Some seem like they're noble, like yourselves, and I say, yeah, sure, uh, please take me out to lunch. <laughs> so, let me tell you some stuff I learned in here. Uh, so first thing we need to talk about is, what are we gonna talk about when we talk about changing a mind? Some cultures don't even have this phrase in their language. This concept doesn't even make any sense, but we have it in ours, and it's worth sort of burying a, uh, you got digging into it a little bit. Uh, generally speaking, the, the mind has three major constructs that you're attempting to change if you're trying to have some sort of conversation or some sort of public information campaign. There are millions of constructs in the brain, but we can sort of put them into these three little silos. There's beliefs, these are propositions we believe are either true or false. Like uh, I could say uh, the best James Bond was played by Patrick Swayze. And uh, I can believe that very uh, deeply, and then you can say that, no, that's not true because Patrick Swayze never played James Bond, and it doesn't mean that I'll still believe that it's true. So, beliefs are propositions that consider to be true or false. These change all the time with experience or persuasion or learning or education. So do attitudes. These are our spectrum of positive and negative evaluation. Like I could say, uh, there's no better ice cream than pistachio, and you're like, that's bonkers. Uh, but I could also say uh, the, uh, Donald Trump was the greatest president that ever lived, and you can say, no, that's bonkers. And the, this feels like a belief. And a lot of the problems we have when we try to persuade people is we get these two things confused. Because saying Donald Trump is the greatest president ever is not a belief. That's an attitude. It's like an opinion you have about ice cream. And the way you approach that is much different than approaching a propositional piece of logic. And then there's value. That's our hierarchy of concerns, problems, and goals that we consider most worth our effort. 
That's like saying all of our tax dollars, more, most of our tax dollars should go to education. And then another person says, no, those same tax dollars should go to aircraft carriers. I have a different value set than you have. These are informed by attitudes and beliefs, but these also inform each other. They play around with each other. You can have beliefs and attitudes about values. You can have attitudes about beliefs and values. The whole thing mushes together. It's a big layer cake of stuff. And this is what changes over time based off of your experiences in the world and being taught things and resisting them. Here's how minds change if you want to get right down to the neurons. Okay, this is Jean Piaget. I always love Piaget. I think about him whenever I get a mixed drink. Because uh, if, if you recall, if you ever had a psychology 101 class, he, they often tell the story of how he would take uh, children and uh, give them a little bit of liquid in a, a short class and you pour it into a tall glass. And at a certain age, children up to a certain age, they think that you've magically made more liquid. And then he marked, oh, look, right about here is when kids go, oh, wait a second, I know it's the same amount of liquid, just different glasses. He did that in the surface of something called uh, genetic epistemology. This is the study of just how knowledge is formed by the brain and how much the brain has to develop to be able to expand that knowledge over time. And there's two processes at play. One is assimilation. Assimilation is interpreting novel information as further confirmation of what you already understand and what is already predictable in the model of reality. And accommodation is acknowledging when some novel piece of information suggests your current understanding is incomplete or incorrect. And that means you must update your internal model in order to reestablish a more predictable reality. Let's get away from all that psychological gobbledygook and show a picture of a dog. Okay, so a little kid sees a dog and all the people around them are like, they've never seen one before, like, look, dog, 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 dog. Hey, look, little cute dog, cute dog. And they really want the kid to say dog at some point. And when the kid finally says dog, what Piaget would say happened is something sort of categorical just locked in. Okay, this is not a person, so it's non-human, doesn't wear clothes, covered in fur, walks on four legs, has a tail, dog, thank you, got it, ready to go out in the world and see dogs. Then later on, they'll see something like this, and they'll point at it and say, oh look, dog. Or if they're a little bit more advanced, they'll say, big dog. And then all the parents are like, no, 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 not dog, not dog, horse. And this is a huge moment for all of us. We all experience this as children, because you are attempting to assimilate. The child's attempting to assimilate the horse into the dog model, because look at it, it's not wearing clothes, it's on all fours, it has a tail, it's uh, covered in fur, not a person, but not dog, huh? Well, this means there must be a larger category in which we can fit both dog and horse. And they may not have a word for it yet, but it's gonna be something like animal or creature, and they really actually must expand their mind to accommodate this new aspect of knowledge. And we're always doing this, all the time. You're doing it right now with me, currently. Our whole lives, we're assimilating and accommodating, assimilating and accommodating. But as our models of reality get more complex, it becomes a lot easier and a lot more appealing to assimilate. It becomes dangerous to change your mind we ought not to. Like if I, right here, said, hey, I want to tell you during this talk, uh, I've been doing this new thing where I drink a cup of bleach every morning. It's really doing wonders for me. This will be resisted by everybody in the room. That does not assimilate well into your model. You don't want to, this, you don't want to accommodate that, and uh, you're going to attempt to push it out, right? It's a good move that we do this. And as the models get more complex, it becomes a lot harder to accommodate. So what does that lead us to? Well, one of my favorite studies in psychology that demonstrates this. This was done by Bruner and Postman in 1955 in Harvard. I love this study. It's my top five psychology studies. Here's how it worked. You got a group of people. You uh, pick them one at a time, and you show them on a screen a playing card. They're given a little clicker. And they're told to say out loud the suit and color of the card, then click the button, retesting your reaction times. This is what they would do. Then we go, okay, great. I'm seeing a uh, black two of clubs. Click. Got it? That is a uh, red ace of spades. And I see here, uh huh, that is a uh, black nine of uh, uh, diamonds. And they would start to hesitate and slow down. And uh, yeah, that's it. It's a black king of hearts. Uh, and they would get slower and slower because what they hadn't told the uh, subjects was they had slipped in a bunch of cards that weren't the right color to the suit. And they could manipulate it behind the scenes. They could actually turn up the number of anomalies or turn them down. And they were measuring what would happen when they would do that. And what they discovered was that as they turned up the number of anomalies, people would enter something they would later call perceptual crisis. They'd see a card like this and they'd call it purple. Or if it was a black card, they would call it gray. They would refuse to accept it at first, but they didn't know they were refusing to accept it. 
and they would start to freak out. And these are actual quotes from the studies. These are real things that the subject said. Well, I'll be damned if I know whether it's red or what. <laughs> yeah, it didn't even look like a car at that time. I'm not even sure now what a spade looks like. My God. <laughs> Truly lost it and freaked out. They would sweat, they would palpitate, they would enter into a perceptual crisis. And that was always the moment right before they went, oh, ah, I get it. OK, you changed some of the colors. Cool. Get it. And they thought that was miraculous and marvelous to see the human mind actually engage in this. And you can see the, the number of anomalies as they increase, the response time increases until a certain point when it drops back down to baseline. And here, all the anomalies are invisible. They just don't even see if they're all suit. They just name it and keep going. Then they uh, start trying to shove it in there. They're trying to assimilate. They're saying it was perfect. Uh, it's great, and they really want to keep that current model. There's no such thing as cards. It can be different colors. And then after there's a certain amount of anomalies, you can't accept this anymore. You have to give in to it, and you hit your perceptual crisis, and that's when you have your epiphany. And in the epiphanous moment, you just create a new category. Cards can be off color. I'm currently witnessing that. I've expanded my mind. I can expect that more in the future and predict it. And this is how we change our mind. We well, can notice there's a built-in resistance here, and there ought to be. And one of the things I, I love about this is that this is how we uh, become more accurate about the world, and yet we push against it quite a bit. And this is represented all <coughs> over the place, and it can be summed up by Thomas Kuhn. He's a philosopher of science who came up with the paradigm shift uh, theory, which goes along with assimilation and accommodation. Novelty uh, emerges only with difficulty, manifested by resistance, against the background provided by expectation. And it's this resistance that's made us, can I go into a moral panic right now? Because I'm sure all of you have had a family get together where you've encountered this resistance. I'm sure all of you have tried to have some sort of chat <coughs> somewhere on Reddit or otherwise, where you're like, why not even get involved in it? And now we see it in our politics in a completely new form. It's an old version, an old thing in a new format. And that's what I want to talk about is some of this resistance and why it happens and what you can do about it. Um, the first thing is to note that facts don't work the way you think they do. Uh, maybe, some of you may be already on board with this. There's this thing in science communication uh, called the information deficit model. It's been around forever. Uh, all these thinkers in the day, they were like Benjamin Franklin said, here's how we fix all this arguing. We have, uh, we'll put a uh, public library in every hamlet in the United States. Once everybody has a library, everybody, not just these nobles, will have access to all the knowledge. They'll read it all, and we'll all agree on what it means, and we'll have a Democratic utopia. That was, that was an idea. Seemed like it would work. Then you have these uh, uh, 19th century rationalist philosophers like, no, here's the thing you do. Public education. We will take all the peasants and all the people and all the farmers, and we'll give them the educations that we got, and we'll work them through it, and then everybody will have access to all the facts. We'll all agree on what those facts mean. We'll have a democratic utopia. And then you have the cyberpunks of the 90s all the way up until today who are like, no, no, here's what you do. You give everybody first, you give them Encarta on CD-ROM, and then later on, the internet, Wikipedia. You have access to all the knowledge of all of the humanity in your phone. We will all have all the facts. We will all agree on what those facts mean, and democratic utopia. So that's uh, not worked out, and that's why they don't call that that's anymore. They call it the, de the information deficit hypothesis. And ironically, the hypothesis has failed. Um, no, this doesn't work that way because we don't just, you can't just dump a pile of facts on a person. You can't send them a bunch of YouTube videos. You can't send them a bunch of links to say, read the things I read that made me think the things I think, and you'll think the things that I think because that's how it works. It ain't going to work that way. You have to do other things. Let me tell you why. Uh, these people were right about one thing. Reason's awesome. They were trying to develop a democratic utopia around the idea of reason. Big R reason is great. Propositional logic is great. Uh, they're People here who teach classes on these such things, they're great. But this is the, something that runs democracy. We are run on reason that is modulated by motivated reason aim. And I want to talk to you about what motivated reasoning is. And until you understand motivated reasoning and have a grasp of it on your, in yourself and others, you won't be able to employ reason to get to the truth or to attitudes that aren't harmful or to values that serve the common good. Uh, let's play a game. Uh, I've talked so much, it's time to wake you up with a game. So this is going to be audience participation time. There's going to be several of those in the rest of this talk. There's a game created by the great uh, psychologist, the, uh, the father of the psychology of reason, Peter Wason. I'm going to name three numbers out of all the numbers in the universe. 
And your job is just to pick out, figure out what secret rule I'm using to pick out those numbers. And the way we're going to do this is everyone's going to raise your hands. And when you think you've figured out my secret rule, you lower your hand and I can see when we're all, we've got it all figured out. So first things first, everyone raise your hand. And here we go. I'm picking out three numbers using a secret rule. Two, four, six. What rule am I using to pick out these numbers? If you think you've got it figured out, lower your hands. Yes, all but a few have already, oh my god, I almost everybody, okay. I'll do some more, 10, 12, 14. We're all, oh, we've got one hand left. Anybody who still doesn't know, keep it down if you know it. Yeah, uh, and uh, 24, 26, 28. Okay, if you still have your hand up, I cannot help you. Maybe go back to something more remedial before college. Cool, well, that's the game. This is great, the whole class has figured out my rule. Um, let's, let's uh, prove that you figured out my rule. You're right here, so I'm gonna ask you. Uh, you pick out three numbers using my rule. So, um, I don't know, it would be 10. 8, 10, 12. Yes, thank you. This is my rule. Thank you very much. Round of applause. Thank you. Mikhail, thank you. You did a wonderful job. So here's what could happen from here. Uh, I could just keep talking and never tell you anything else, and you'd feel great. You saw something in the natural world. You formed a hypothesis about it. You put forth something that felt like it might confirm the hypothesis. You got your hypothesis confirmed. I said it was confirmed. We move on. But here are three more numbers that use my rule. 1, 2, and 3 and uh, 33, 3,371, 9,999. Because my rule is any three numbers, just one bigger than the last. But <laughs> if you assume my rule was three even numbers in a row, which also falls within that you know, framework, you could get confirmation that you were right, and then you would assume that you could figure out the rule, and you might do stuff based off of that, but it would be wrong. And that confirmatory nature is called confirmation bias. And it's one of more than 220 built-in biases in the brain that we operate with all the time. Usually they're adaptive, because if you want to like find your, lost your, don't worry, everybody does that, by the way. It just means you're a person. Uh, if you lost your car keys, you should look for them in your kitchen, not uh, mount a mission to Mars to see if maybe they're there. It's good to confirm your assumptions. We work well that way. It's just uh, when you add tools like this to this uh, confirmation bias, you get really, really weird results in the modern world. That's demonstrated by this little thing we call it the emergency. Vaccines cause autism? Well, I have one million results that say they don't, and one result that says they do. I knew it. Just because I have it doesn't mean it's true! If you are seeking confirmation and you go on the internet, you will find it. So. This is a really good moment to split the talk in half and return to uh, this original idea. Oh boy, what's going on out there? Well, it's a lot of people looking for confirmation of things that matter to them. And if you're hesitant and worried about vaccines, you can find reasons to be hesitant and concerned about them. You think the earth might be flat and there's a military industrial complex that's trying to trick you into thinking that? Well, you'll find people that agree with you. If you want to storm the Capitol and seal the Declaration of Independence, you can get together on the airplanes and do that with people who think that's a good idea. And uh, if you don't think we land on the moon, there are more than a million people in the United States that still think that that was all a hoax. So, this is a problem, but is truth dead? No. It's just that we're really bad at using the internet right now. <laughs> and we'll get better at it. Um, there are some things you need to know to get better at it. I'm going to take up the next part of my, with my favorite things from the book. I'm going to tell you my favorite people that I met. But first, one little audience participa participation thing to just knock you out of this cognitive kind of thinking in two questions. Who here, raise your hand, believes that you are right about everything? Every one of your beliefs, every one of your attitudes, all of your values are the perfect, you're not wrong about anything. You are absolutely correct about everything you currently think, feel, and believe. Okay. No hands, which means there's no future politicians in this room, but... Um, well, here's the second question then. So what are you wrong about? You've all told me that you aren't right about everything. You're wrong about some things. How come you don't know what you're wrong about? Why aren't you doing anything about that? And how would you go about doing that? Two big questions. It should introduce you to that grand concept of intellectual humility. And it should help you in conversation go, hmm, maybe I'm not right about this thing that I feel so strongly about. How would I determine that in a single conversation? Uh, one thing that gets in the way is called naive realism. This is a psychological concept. It's the intuition that uh, what you see, that you see the world as it truly is, free from bias or the limitations of your senses. This is very easy to debunk. All I have to do is point out that I, I doubled all the V's and you didn't see it. 
<laughs> because uh, you see the world as you assume it will be. Uh, it's the result of thinking, not the process of thinking that appears spontaneously in consciousness. And psychologist George Miller said that. And guess what? You all already knew this if you remember this. I'm hoping most of you remember this. This is the dress. It's the most viral thing that ever went viral on the internet. And to this day, nothing else has spread this virally. Every country, every age group, every demographic has seen this thing. Everywhere I go in the world, they'll, oh yeah, the dress. So who here sees it as black and blue? Raise your hand. All right, lower those. Who here sees it as yellow and gold, yellow and white? Yeah. Usually about half of the people see it one way and half see it the other. And if you see it that way, you can't see it the other way. And the people who do see it the way that you don't see it seem wrong, crazy, weird. And you might want to argue with them and say, hey, look, it, it can't be. What's wrong with you? How, how do we fix this? I wanted to understand this deeply. Let me tell you a little story of this. 2015, there was a woman who was getting ready for her daughter's wedding. She was in London. She went to a dress shop. She took a picture of this with a crappy phone on a cloudy day. And she sent it to her daughter, and her daughter was showing it to people. She's like, hey, should I wear this to your wedding? And her daughter was like showing it to people. And some of them were like, I don't know if black and blue works. And some people were like, I don't know if yellow and uh, white work, gold and white. And they were like, what are you talking about, gold and white? What are you talking about, black and blue? And then at the wedding, they showed this around. And uh, the musician at the wedding shared this on her social media, and it just went viral from there. Uh, she put it up on, it made it to BuzzFeed, and it went from there. And all these hashtags hit Twitter. Blue and black, white and gold, dress gate, uh, the dress. These are still the most trending hashtags that I've ever hashtagged. Uh, they broke Twitter long before Elon Musk broke Twitter. These, <laughs> these, these made so, so Twitter would not load on your phone because they were being spread so much the system couldn't take it. And celebrities were chiming in. It was wild. You had, um, oh yeah, I watched the post. They said this is the drama that divided the planet, which presaged everything else, I think. Uh, we were such sweet summer children back then. Uh, Taylor Swift, I don't understand this odd dress debate, and I feel like it's a trick somehow. I'm confused and scared. P.S. Obviously, it's blue and black. Uh, then you have uh, Kim Kardashian. What color is that dress? I see white and gold. Kanye sees black and blue. Who is colorblind? Uh, B.J. Novak, just white and gold. Uh, Mindy Kaling, it's blue and black. It's a blue and black dress. Are you fucking kidding me? Uh, it was everywhere, and uh, as I was going around trying to get more information about how minds change, some people at NYU said, I got some people you should talk to. These two neuroscientists who were studying the dress and they figured it all out. I was like, why do I want to talk to them about that? And they were like, it'll make sense when you meet them. So on the left, that's Pascal Wallach, this is Michael Karlovich, they're neuroscientists at NYU, they, stutter, they study uh, perception, color vision and other types of perception. And when I met them, we went to a, uh, a restaurant in New York and before we could even get started talking, Karlovich took his phone out and showed me. He said, like, hey, uh, what do you see? <laughs> and I was looking at him, the waiter has not even come over yet. I'm like, I, it's, I, you know, it depends on the lighting of the room we're in, the projector, but I was like, oh, yeah, it's, a, it's an egg, it's like kind of green. And he was like, nah, damn. And he put it back in his pocket, and said, what's up with the egg? And they explained, when they were trying to figure out the dress, they were trying to find a perfectly perceptually ambiguous color object. And they thought that this might be the first one they could go with. They thought some people would have red, green eggs and ham, and some people wouldn't have, and they made it just light, just enough green to be green, and some people might not see it as green, some people would. Turned out it didn't work. They tried pink flamingo, uh, lawn decorations, all sorts of stuff. And uh, they eventually did settle on the perfectly perceptually ambiguous color rocket. <laughs> I present it to you now. This is the croc, the uh, foam resin shoe thing. And uh, here's what makes it perfectly perceptually ambiguous. Uh, what, this had color to it, but I put it in Photoshop and made it black and white. What color was it before I did that? So this is what they wanted. Everybody knows what a croc is, but a croc doesn't have a very specific color we associate with it. So whatever color you think this croc might have been, it goes into your prior experiences with crocs. It turns out. If you've never seen a camouflage croc, you won't say camouflage. Is what comes out. If you have, you might. So this is ambiguous, and the brain attempts to disambiguate it through your prior experiences with the object. It was called disambiguation. And they thought that has got to be what's going on with the dress, but it's new. We've never seen this in neuroscience. We're, we're used to something called uh, intrapersonal bistable perceptual illusions. And the idea of that is um, the duck rabbit and the Reuben vase. Brains see this duck rabbit. Every brain in this room sees it as a duck for a second, then a rabbit for a second, because it's ambiguous as to which one it is. 
but there's two very strong disambiguations, and you just vacillate between the two. So it's bistable, but it's interpersonal, which means every single brain goes back and forth between two possible interpretations. Same with the vase. It's uh, people in uh, silhouette, or it's a vase. Other artists later made it even more pronounced. Two possible interpretations. Nobody has a third or a fourth or a fifth, but everybody has <laughs> these two. But the dress was different. The dress is two possible interpretations, but every brain picks only one of the two. This makes it the first example in neuroscience. It's only called an intradjacent bistable perceptual image. And they were like, how could that be? They had some suspicions. One thing they thought might be a play is called color constancy. So I'm going to tell you something. There's no way I can get you to believe this just for me telling it to you. But squares A and B in this image are the exact same color. But there's no way that's what you're actually experiencing right now in your subjective reality. That's because the brain, in certain situations, will lie to you to give you something that it feels is more useful than the truth. I will prove this to you. I threw it in Photoshop and captured it. So here we go. We're going to grab A and just pull it on down. And you can see, same goal. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> then we also go back up there. <laughs> now it seems like it's the other color. We can do it with the other one too. Just have to remember how Photoshop works. And then, chicka, 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 same call. Maybe we can put them side by side just to get it out there in that nether region of Photoshop. Oh, sorry, my video, my video is <laughs> right, right out of time. The, uh, so okay, they're the same color. Why would, it, why would this be happening? Why would it, uh, your brain lie to you? Because over here, this is, first of all, this is not a real checkerboard. It's all like an illustration, so it doesn't actually exist. So you're already doing a little bit of work. Your brain's already saying, let me imagine that that's real. And it looks like that square is in shadow. And through lots of other research, we know that when we see things in shadow that we're slightly familiar with, the brain will do a little internal photoshopping. It will turn up the color balance, will turn up the brightness to give you a little idea of like, well, this is what it ought to look like. This, uh, there's assumptions, there's all sorts of uh, hypotheses. Maybe this is to be able to see blood in low light conditions. Maybe this is able to be able to see ripe fruit in low light conditions. You just turn up contrast. Um, the blood one has a lot more support behind it, but we don't actually know the answer to it. But we do this all the time. That's why you can look in a dark closet and see the sweater and say, oh, it's green, instead of whatever actual electromagnetic waves are going into your eyeballs. This uh, means that we are really uh, prone to doing this in moments of overexposure and low light. Here's another great example. This is an uh, image of strawberries. There are zero red pixels in this image. No red is coming out of the projector and hitting the screen and going into your eyeballs. There's no red in this picture at all, but you're all seeing red strawberry. It's a lie. Your brain is telling you because it's assuming that that would be more useful than the truth. The truth of this image is that it's overexposed in teal light. And when you have anything overexposed, the brain will subtract the luminant. Right now, your brains are subtracting teal from the image, and what's left behind is black and white. And then you're filling in the black and white with what you assume the color should be, red, because you have previous experience of strawberries. You have strawberry priors, they would say. Good name for a band. So we can prove this, too. Uh, I'm just going to take out the bottom here. Take your hand and put it over the strawberry to see the actual color. Put it back down, you'll see the trick. And you can kind of wiggle them around to see the truth and the trick back and forth. It's black and white, overexposing the teal. Your brain is subtracting the teal. And they were like, OK, these two things together, I think that might be what's going on with the dress. So they did this incredible study, 13,000 participants, all sorts of factors to make sure that it was like the most hardcore science ever. Pascal used to be a physicist, so he had this whole dream of making uh, cognitive science hold up the same standards of physics. And uh, here's what they figured out. Yes, this image is overexposed. It's overexposed, but it's ambiguous what the, so the kind of overexposure you're experiencing. Some people are seeing the dress, they think it's overexposed in sunlight. And some people who see the dress think it's overexposed in <coughs> artificial incandescent light. And sunlight uh, is blue. It's uh, the light coming from the sky, more accurately, is in the blue side of the spectrum. So they think it's overexposed in blue, 
they subtract the blue to see the truth, and you end up with, and then, and then uh, other people think it's you know, exposed in incandescent light, it's mostly yellow, they subtract the yellow. You have two different groups of people with two different priors. Where do these priors come from? Well, they interview these people, talk to them. People who tend to uh, be late risers, they work indoors, they don't have a garden, they have had more experience with objects overexposed in incandescent light. That's one set of people. You have other people who work outdoors, they have a window in their office, they garden a lot, they play in the woods when they were kids, they have more experience with things overexposed in sunlight. We have two different groups of people who subtract two different luminants, you get two different subjective realities. And if you've never seen it the way other people see it, there you go. I love this. Okay. So the real question is, uh, well, what's the truth? What is the truth? Well, this is a fun thing philosophically. The truth is whatever your brain says it is. That's the truth. Uh, that image doesn't have a, a color. That image is neither black and blue nor white and gold. The image is whatever you disambiguate it to be. That image. The actual dress is black and blue. I got to see the actual dress. Uh, I asked them if I could wear it, and they were like, uh, absolutely not, you will destroy it. But uh, they meant, let me lay it over my body. But yeah, in this image, I've got a good camera, and I'm in a well-lit room. You're gonna see that version of the truth. But the image is neither. Well, this is my favorite part of the story. They were like, the only way we can actually advance science is if we actually create this from scratch. And the way they put it to be was we want to build the nuclear bomb of cognitive science which uh, is the way they put it. I was like, well, what, what is that going to be? I, uh, they explained to me, well, there's a ladder of scientific hypotheses. First, we observe, like if we see grasses, we draw them, then we describe them in detail, we have all these different parts for them, then we attempt to explain it with the tools and understanding of the day, and then we get to a point where we really feel like we got it. If we see grasses somewhere, we will uh, know exactly, we see an environment, we'll know what kind of grass grows there so we can predict it very accurately, and then, we reach creation. We have not reached the point with grass where we can create grass from scratch. We haven't gotten to the top of the ladder there. But we have gotten there with nuclear physics. We can create bombs and reactors because we've gotten all the way from observation to creation. So they wanted to do that with the dress. They thought if we could do that, we could apply the same sort of principles in physics to something in cognitive science that had never been done before. And I demonstrate it to you here. This is the nuclear bomb of cognitive science. Socks and Crocs. Turned out you had to add socks to get this thing to work, and I'll ask you now. Who here sees uh, gray Crocs and green socks? Raise your hand. Gray, co gray Crocs are taupe or kind of a grayish green socks. Who here sees pink, so pink Crocs and white socks? Yeah. In uh, the research, about 40% of people see them as gray and green, and the rest of the people see them as white and pink. So they were able to recreate it. How did they do it? It's a beautiful story. Our college, when he was a grad student, worked in a grow house growing plants. And uh, in that grow house growing plants, they used green grow lights because plants aren't sensitive to that. I won't mess with their circadian rhythms. You don't think it's sunlight. There was a guy in there wearing Crocs. When he looked at the Crocs, they were black and white. Uh, they go out into the sunlight. They turn pink. And he was like, oh, neat. I'm studying color vision. I know what's happening here. There's no pink light coming out of that green grow light, so my brain's not receiving any, I just see it as gray. But out here, there's pink in the color spectrum. It's bouncing off of those crocs going to my brain. Cool, I can't wait to go back in the grow house. But then he goes back in the grow house and they stay pink. And he was like, that's impossible. Yeah. That's not physically possible. Physics says that this is not happening. That's because his brain already created a prior. It's like, hey, these are actually pink, see with pink. You're getting an ambiguous image disambiguated. He was like, and they were trying to figure out the dress. It's like, I got the greatest idea. That's what we're going to do. So they went on this mad dash. They got grow lights, and crocs, and brains, and socks. And here's how it works. You get the green grow light. Uh, it shoots green light into the white socks. It reflects off the green. It goes into the brain. Uh, and you get white socks and gray crocs for uh, people who are disambiguating it one way. Uh, and you get. Uh, Pink Crocs and uh, White Sox, well, the light in this room is shifting these images a little bit, but here's why you get two different versions of this. Um, some people see this image and they think to themselves, okay, I get it. These socks are actually white. The light is green, which means these Crocs must be a certain color. Other people see those socks in the image and say, they must be green socks. Like they're dyed green. And they are assuming that if they are actually green socks, then the color of the crocs is actually what they are, and they don't fall in the image. 
And they also divided the two communities of priors. And this is the part that usually gets groans. It's OK. Uh, the older a person is, the more likely they see them as pink and white. And the younger they are, the more likely they see them as gray and white. Why? Because older people have had less life experiences with off-color socks. <laughs> younger people have had more experiences with colored socks. And it just comes down to, I'm aware of a world. It's like the anomalies in the playing field. I'm aware of a possibility that these could be colored. And again, you have to ask, well, what is the truth? Well, the truth of the image is there, it's both. Like, whatever you disambiguate is what it is. But I do find it quite appealing that for some people, they see the truth behind the image, and some people believe the truth of the image. And it all depends on how much experience you've had with socks. This is an important lesson for all of us. They call it surf that. Substantial uncertainty combined with ramified or fourth prior assumptions will cause disagreement. Uh, all these different life experiences you had, these, these assumptions that you're unaware that you're making, and until you meet another person who disagrees with you over these disambiguations, you're never aware that you could disagree with somebody. You could have lived your whole life and never ever met somebody you saw address another way. And until you meet that person, you don't have the argument that's going to help you understand something. But the worst thing you could do is try to convince the other person that you're right and they're wrong. And the worst thing they could do is the, is the inverse relationship there. Uh, it's important that the best forms of persuasion that I've come across, the ones that actually work to get around all these resistances, are the ones in which two people go shoulder to shoulder and they enter into a dynamic where they say, isn't that fascinating that we disagree? I find you an interesting, compelling, intelligent, rational person who has goals and values. How come we disagree on this? What if we teamed up to try to solve a mystery together? And the mystery is, how can we be disagreeing? Because there's a deeper truth. It's neither this dress color or this dress color, this sock color or this sock color. Something is happening that required all of this scientific research to get to. That's the actual truth. And that might be even more invisible to both of us, but if we work together, maybe we can at least agree there's something deeper here. And you can apply that to any topic, gun control, immigration, LGBT rights, all the persuasion techniques that I've trained in that work, this is where they come from. And they've built off this cert pad model. So the solution here is you have to argue is what it comes down to. You can't argue the way we've been arguing. People aren't unreachable. It's more like we keep trying to reach the moon with a lab. And when we don't get there, we're like, oh, I can't get to the moon. You just need better tools, and different tools, and you come around and you arrive at intuitively. Um, I'm going sh to shift to one last thing. There's my time running out, but I want to have one more group of thing with you. Uh, when you engage in this kind of conversation, what you're going to come up against is uh, motivated reason. It's going to come to you in the form of justification, and I love these. My second favorite study is psychology. You have a bunch of people, you tell them that they flipped a coin, and either they, uh, the coin comes with heads or tails, whatever they pick. And uh, if it's what you picked, you get $200. If it's not what you pick, you lose $100. And then they ask every subject, you're now offered a second identical gamble, do you take it? Well, if they tell the people what they've uh, done, how the outcome of the experiment, people who got $200 will say, yes, I'd like to play again, I'm ahead, so I can risk it. And people who lost money will say, yes, I would like to play again, I need to win back what I just lost. So either way, you find a justification to keep playing. This is how casinos work. Uh, you will always find a reason to keep going, even though you got two different results. There's always a reason to eat the chocolate cake. There's always a reason to do the thing you want to do, the thing you're motivated to do. But one of my favorite things in all of psychology is if you run this experiment again and you do not tell people the outcome of the flip, like the experimenter flips it and doesn't show it to them, and then they say, you're offered a second item of gamble, do you take it? People say no. The whole, the whole everyone, you know, about 85% of people say no, I won't do it. <laughs> And they won't do it because they can't come up with a justification to do so. Even though we know it wouldn't matter what I told them, they'd come up with, they'd use that justification to move forward. If you take away the justification, you can't make a decision. One of the most important things to know in psychology is whether it's in an argument or making a decision by yourself, that little thing that's taking place where you're weighing pros and cons. Uh, we don't make the decision that's best, or the one that's based off the most facts and accuracy. We make the decision we want to make. We make the decision that's easiest to justify. So, Tread carefully with your own justifications and those of others. Um, I'm going to wrap up with one last little fun thing about reasoning. Here's what we're going to do. This is something from the cognitive reflection test. Read this carefully with me. In a lake, there is a patch of lily pads. Every day, the patch doubles in size. If it takes 48 days for the patch to cover the entire lake, how long would it take for the patch to cover half the lake? I'm looking for someone in this room who thinks they have the answer to this question, but they really feel you've got the answer. You know the answer to the question, okay? 
Everyone else, take the answer you think's in your head right now and just hold on to it for a second, okay? What is the answer to the question? 47 days. Okay, please, first of all, may I, may I have a little grumbly fumbly about this? 47 days? <laughs> Some people are saying no. Okay, please explain your reason. If it takes, if it's gonna double each day, then the day before it's full is the day that it's half, because it doubles. Yeah, I heard some ahs, right? Does that sound right, does everybody agree? Everybody agrees. This is, I call this uh, the chocolate of the peanut butter and chocolate of my comeuppance. Um, in writing this book, not only did I change my mind about how, to, how we interact with each other in persuasive forms when it's one-on-one, -on -one, it's the group thing that really shook me up because all the science I've been writing about for You Are Not So Smart had used experiments where they would ask questions like that and they would get everybody's individual answers. And in a room like this, you'd probably have 60, 50% of the people would get the wrong answer, and they would say, look at people, we're so bad at reasoning. We're so bad at problem solving and logic. You ask a group of people, 50% of them get this question wrong. And in the cognitive reflection task, 100% uh, of people will get one of the questions wrong. It's a battery of them. But when they did new experiments where they did it in a group exercise like this, and they just let people square, pull off into groups of three or more, what you get is this exact thing. Either somebody has the answer already because they've reasoned through it, or in the arguing they come with the actual solution, and then when they trade it back and forth, everybody flips over the right answer, and you go from being half the room's wrong to 100% of the room's correct. And this is the way we evolved to discuss everything. This is how we worked as people. And if you go through the history of all the great changes in, uh, by, in social uh, movements in time, they've always worked that way. Somehow it got people in groups arguing, those groups moved their way up and finally got to legislatures. Then we get the internet, and a weird thing happens. Uh, we don't talk to each other like that on the internet. We're getting better at it, but we're not very good at it already. Like Twitter and TikTok and Facebook and every other place we meet up, we just feel like we're having a conversation as a group, but really we're in these little individual spaces tossing arguments into piles and defending ourselves and feeling like, oh no, am I a good or a bad person? We never do this group exercise that we just, you know, thank you very much, that's amazing, right? So, my good friend Alistair Kroll, he's an internet researcher, said, on the internet, when you say, I want grilled cheese, you're not actually presenting an argument for grilled cheese, you're saying, help me find the grilled cheese room, because that's what I want, and I'm gonna go find like-minded grilled cheese enthusiasts. And you're helping the machine search for the group you wanna be a part of, as opposed to using the machine to have a conversation with the group you're with. We have to get around that, and we will get around that. I know plenty of scientists are advising plenty of people from the UN on down who make a different way of uh, conversation take place online. Um, so the solution is, yeah, we have to argue. We just have to get better at it. And we have to use the things that uh, science has told us. In the course of writing this book, I don't have time to do this, but anybody who wants to pair off with me and do a demonstration, I'll change your mind about something. Uh, I learned it from deep canvassing, motivation interviewing, and the street epistemology. It's all in the book. It's the last few chapters. And I'll leave you with this. I'm not going to give you the answer to this. I want you to argue about it by yourselves, away from me, and figure it out on your own. It takes five machines, five minutes to make five widgets. How long would it take 100 machines to make 100 widgets? Take a screenshot if you have to. I would like you to argue with that with your friends to see if you can do the same thing we did here, which is look on it in a group and get to the truth. I'll leave, that's the end of the discussion, but I'll leave that up so you should take a picture. Thank you very much.